we are really proud of the project we're making uh, and we're selling. Um, like we try to create a right balance. So we always have something a little bit sour, a little really acidic and um, something a little bit more adventurous. But that, that point of balance in a, in a menu, that's what keeps me going. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading to Newcastle to talk to Nicolas Polar. He is a French chef uh, who worked for many years in Melbourne and then shifted north to uh, make shoe beautiful eclair. Nick, welcome to Dirty Linen. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Danny. It's, um, yeah, look, it's, I'm really excited to talk to you. I've followed your career for many years and, um, yeah, always love what you do. Um, I know that when you first came to Melbourne, you were working with Shannon Bennett at Voodemont, the original Voodemont in Carlton. Uh, I've really enjoyed the restaurants that you owned here, Brooks and Ombras. And I think, you know, the, you know, you won Young Chef of the Year, the restaurants had hats. I think for a lot of people, it was a surprise when you left the city um, to work on something quite different. So I'm excited to learn more about it from you, about, you know, how everything's played out. Uh, but baby, where do you want to start? Shall we start with back in the day? <laughs> Uh, which days? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. It's, it's 28 years now. I've been uh, been a chef. I'm 42 years old, so I started pretty pretty young. Um, so I'm I'm basically from a really really tiny village in the north of France, um, about half an hour from the Belgian border. Uh, fishing village uh, used to be a lot of uh, used to be a big coal industry. Um, which became a steel industry um, and everything kind of collapsed really quickly. Um, a lot of people was unemployed and things like this. Um, and I could see a lot of people struggling and think, and that wasn't really the path I wanted to do. Um, and I always, um, I was surrounded by really good home cooks, my aunties and grandma, my mom, uh, my mom is really, really good at cooking. Uh, my dad is pretty good. He's got his own little recipe book and makes his own soups and sauces and um, ox tongues and stews and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, so when um, when I was about 13 years old, um, I was telling my mom and dad I wanted to be a chef and telling my friends and a lot of people was kind of um, laughing at me because it's not something was expected to do in uh, the part of France where I was coming from. Um, he was going to work in steel factories or industrial fishing or cheap shipyards, uh, welding, um, all that kind of industries. I wasn't interested in it. And um, when I was uh, just 14, so I turned 14 in July and the 1st of August 1994, I, um, I started an apprenticeship. So we looked into a restaurant first. My mom and dad um, helped me to do that and book an appointment to go and speak to a head chef. His name was uh, is Alain Jolet. Um, and um, we've never really been in a restaurant at that stage with my family. Um, it was mostly like cafeterias and shopping centers and things like that. So I had no idea what a restaurant was actually. Um, like, um, and um, and yes, yeah, so I've spoken to the to the head chef. Spent the next few school holidays, so it was Christmas, the Easter's um, school holidays there. And um, I turned fourteen in July, early July, and I uh, started my apprenticeship in the first of August. Uh, so that was nineteen ninety four. Um, and I stayed there until end of August 1998. Um, and I decided to move to Scotland, uh, where I could um, see new horizon, I guess. Um, it was an exchange with the two schools, uh, obviously one in Scotland, one in France. And um, I, um, at the end of the eight months, um, I actually stayed there for two years. Um, and where, while I was working there, I met a French guy called Andre, who was just coming back from Australia, and um, he 
he was talking to to me and us or the chefs um, about how great Australia was and so we four of us decided to to go all together so we arrived in Melbourne in December 1999 wow Nick, it's it's just incredible to think that when you started working in a restaurant, you'd never even been to one. I mean, what was it like to just plunge into this unknown world? Um, it was really unknown. So that, that, I think that was the positive uh, side of it. Um, obviously, I was working long hours. It was a one Michelin star restaurant um, and not knowing what Michelin star was. And so I was just basically... I was basically doing what I was told to do and I was just, you know, working like everyone else. And, um, yeah, so um, I had a great um, mentor, um, Alain, Alain Jolet, the head chef, was, was an amazing person. He's kind that kind of person who could take or would take the time to put somebody under his wing and teach that person everything he knows and everything I know about cooking um, it's is still now from him there's I would say 70% of the technique I use in the kitchen are classic um, or I've used during my whole career classic classic French and that's techniques Alain uh, taught me Um, yeah so and I was um, I was living on the on the top of the kitchen. There was an attic, and that's where I was spending the week. So I was basically there just to just to work. Um, I was spending three weeks at the restaurant and one week at school. So the week at school was learning geography and history and French and English. So we, um, so I learned mo- most of the trade in um, at the restaurant. Wow, it's just amazing. And when you think about, you know, how a, a young person would begin their career today, it's it's so different. <laughs> I just don't think there are many young chefs living in attics above kitchens in Australia. No, but yeah, it was really hot. <laughs> but um, and it's like my I I, I was never able to um, cook. Or because I moved around the world quite a lot after that, um, and I was never able to cook for my parents, uh, probably until 2003, I think. So I started my apprenticeship in 1994, and the first meal I actually cooked for my parents was in 2003. That is amazing. So was that when they, they came here or you went back to France? No, when I went back to France uh, and Ta came with me and we went we around the whole family. She met the family and things. Um, but, yeah, so when I was doing my apprenticeship, um, the restaurant was closed on Sunday evening and Monday. Um, so I didn't have much time. By the time the kitchen was cleaned up and dishes was done, because I was the one staying in the kitchen doing the dishes, cleaning the floor. So I wasn't really leaving the kitchen before at least 6 p.m. Um, my dad used to drive the 80 kilometers to come and pick me up and driving back 80 kilometers to, to go home. And by the time we get home, it was the dinner was ready. Uh, my mom already made dinner, so we sat on the table at dinner and basically the Monday I spent most of the day sleeping and eating maybe some lunch, some dinner, go to bed again and on Tuesday I was back at work. So it was really tight schedule for a young young person. Um, when I see my son Louis, he's going to turn 12 and uh, I don't really want or see him at 14 years old to start working in the condition I was working. Um, but yeah, it's... It's amazing thinking about it now. Um, I don't know if I would be able to to redo all of this again. Uh, but yeah, but I was just so young and young, stupid. I don't know. But I was just doing what I was told to do. And um, but yeah, it was it was good. Now looking looking back, it was good. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, I'm so interested on this podcast to speak about different pathways in the industry and 
it's really interesting to speak to someone like yourself who's who's done something, you can see the value in it, you're still using those skills that was, must be so embedded in you now, really part of you. But then to think, well, would I want my son to do the same? Yeah, probably not. It's really, it's really interesting. Um, Nick, let's talk about when you arrived in Melbourne. Was the job with Shannon Bennett at Vidamond your first one? No, no. So I got um, I arrived up, up sent letters to because he was just about the Olympic Games was about to start in Sydney, so the industry was looking for workers. Um, so I did send a few resumes. And I got a reply from the Sheraton Tower on South Bank, which is now became Langham, um, and they offered me um, a three years uh, sponsorship visa. So I took the positions. Uh, and a couple of years later, I applied for my permanent resident. And then when I received my permanent resident, I went to work for Shannon at uh, the original Vidamont. So I was in Carlton on Drummond Street. Tell us about that. It was um, It's from everyone I've spoken to. It was a pretty intense kitchen. It was. Um, but yet again, it's, you know, I've never regretted to work with and for Shannon. Um uh, it was a tiny kitchen, really small kitchen, um, and there was um, one, two, three, four, five chefs uh, working in that kitchen. So it was Matt Wilkinson, uh, Ryan Cliff, um, and we, myself, and Shannon was on the pass. Um, and during the day, Shannon was working in the kitchen, helping with preps and everything. Um, and we had a, an apprentice, which is basically a tourner. So it was just helping everyone and doing everything and anything. Um, but yeah, Shannon was already had a, 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 a blueprint in his head. He knew what he, what he wanted to be and what he wanted to achieve. And, um, and he was, um, he was as hard working as we were. Um, and we were as hard working as he was. Um, but yeah, it was really demanding. Um, he was a kind of, he had a bit of a reputation of the bad boy of Melbourne. Um, he loved being in charge. Um, but he was just, um, firing, um, putting fire into the troop, um, which is just, you know, putting the energy into the kitchen for, um, everyone to, to make sure we had a good service and, and things like that. But the kitchen one one of those early kitchen where it was open to the open to the restaurant. So all the all the customer could see, all the customer could hear and um, they could they just couldn't get enough of it. But the food was great. Uh, the technicality of the food was amazing and that really took me back to to when I was working uh, when I did my apprenticeship in France, um, and um, and yeah, interesting. And so, was it? Am I right in thinking that you went from Vudimon back to Europe for a little while? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I um, um, since I was um, uh, a really really young kid, uh, mum and dad, um, the wedding present was a caravan, and um, we 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 travelled down the region called the Lozère. The Aubrac Aveyron, so we just basically just near the Dordogne region, um, just near the big Milo Bridge. So it's not uh, it's not really highly touristic area of France, but it's really raw, it's really natural, um, it's it's beautiful, beautiful part of France. Um, and um, there was a chef over there called um, or a family called the Bra family. B R A S, um, and the, the man in charge was Michel Michel Bra. Um, he was working with with the region, uh, in the region, um, and basically creating amazing dishes. So since I was a kid, I always knew about this guy, and um, and one day I had a conversation with Shannon, and um, Shannon kind of pushed me to to go and apply for a job there. So basically, I did, um, and I, I waited three years to get the job. Um, because there were so many young um, chefs from all over the world who wanted to work there. Um, but at the time, um, the the Bra family was not taking any people as a st- stagiaire. So that means it's um, 
people were going to work there for free. So everyone was working there and working full time on the salary. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the the placement was really restricted. So after three years, I managed to to get a job there. So Ty and I decided to go. Uh, I'm sorry, on the second year, I received an end handwritten letter um, saying they may have a, a position for me, but not sure. They're waiting on a few applicants to, to give them a definitive response. So Tom and I decided to, if I was going to get the job, I had to be in Europe at that time. So we decided to go to, to Europe. So her brother was in London. So we met him in London. And um, I got the final response from, the, from Michelle Brage saying, sorry, but we've got you for next year. So basically, I spent a year in London. I worked at um, uh, Gordon Ramsay at a Chelsea restaurant, which was a really, really different um, kitchen. Um, and obviously, you know, a kitchen is a teamwork. Um, and I just didn't fit. I just didn't fit in a team. Um, I didn't have a, have a really good time. Um, so I decided to, we had some friends in the north of Scotland, so decided to go um, just outside of Inverness, just about 40 minutes, 45 minutes from Inverness. And uh, we stayed there. I was head chef in a small boutique hotel. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was great there. Um, so I was just waiting to get the job at Michel. And uh, when it was time to start, um, flew back to, to France in Lake Yol. And um, Tara stayed in Scotland. We also had to change our wedding date as well for me to go and work at Michel Bra, which uh, the family wasn't really happy with. But, um, but yeah, so, but um, Tara always, always understood and um, followed me and I followed her. Now I think I'm following her more than she's following me. But, uh, but yeah, so... Um, I work Michel Bra. We got married um, in France um, and uh, moved back to Australia. And one day, on my when I came back, I was talking with um, Andrew McConnell, who was about to start Cumulus and uh, Cutler and Co in the same year. And um, he told me that three one two was going to go on the market. So. Ty and I put our house deposit into a business, and um, and yeah, so we opened Embrace, um, and you were you, Danny, was actually our first um, journalist in. Uh, with you were our first review. Um, it was a really, really, really hot day. He was doing all those fires in the uh, in the Yarra Valley, and um, I think he was. For your daughter's birthday or your stepson's birthday, something like this. Oh yeah, my stepson's birthday. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it was only I think it was only you in the dining room and Matt Wilkinson, but I don't think you guys because I think Matt was turning the back to you, so you guys didn't actually see each other. But um, no, this is where I, this is the I'm only now finding out that Matt Wilkinson was there at the same day. Oh, that's so interesting. But it was, but I loved it, right? It was, a, it was a good review, right? Or, or are you going to hang up on me now? From your <laughs> no, from your review, that's when everything started to kick in. Um, we had, um, we had other press writing and things like that. We we had a good time. It was very stressful, really, really stressful, because we were not ready for that. Um, and yeah, and we. Um, through the process, through the the years of having embraced, we met uh, Joel and Mario from Joel's Bar, and we became really, really close, really good friends. Um, they became mentors um, to me, and um, Joel and Mario wanted to open uh, Brooks, uh, but they didn't want to open it with uh, me in the kitchen, and um, so we we went and did that. Um, with a financial backer and um, three years on you know every business of uh, risk um, but one of the major risks became a reality and um, Joel and Mario um, left left the business uh, they had a dispute with um, uh, with our um, 
with our financial backer and um so that was um that was really hard um um i um i tried my best i was working really hard to keep the atmosphere to keep the the people in into the business but unfortunately we had a, a lot of old and good people or staff members actually left um and new one coming in and and again i didn't feel like i was fitting anymore um i wasn't um i wasn't feeling well i wasn't well at all um so i um i decided it was probably time for me to to leave but i didn't want to leave on the spot so i gave um six months resignation um I put new system in place, I put a new menu in place, a new team in place, um, and the new uh, general manager came in, and from there, I think just accelerated, and I actually left a little, probably a little bit earlier than when I wanted to. Um, and um, obviously, because that wasn't planned, two young kids at home, I think Louis was five at the time, and Harry was one. Um, Louis was about to start school, so we decided to to move um, regional. Um, and uh, Tao's mom and dad live in a small town called uh, Wanji Wanji, so it's in on the Lake Macquarie. It's a beautiful part of the world. Um, so I've been coming here for a few years, for a good ten years, just visiting Tao's family. And um, and yeah, so we decided to do the big move in uh, just a few weeks, um, and um, ended up looking for work in Newcastle. Uh, I did find it really hard. Ended up um, started um, a business again, um, so something completely different. Um, so we started a business called Shoe Patisserie. So it's uh, it's what we call uh, a macro business. So it's basically we started the business, uh, but now it'll be six years, getting on to starting our seven year, um, which is basically um, we we're not trying to reinvent the the world declares, but we uh, we're personalizing it um, using a lot of fruits and natural ingredients. Uh, the declares are filled and topped with. Um, uh, recipes are created, um, and I think that's what really keeps me going, doing what I do. Um, I work on my own in a kitchen. I have a kitchen assistant who helps me um, a few hours a week. Um, she's great. She really understands me. Um, we work well together, um, and she does a great job. Um, and uh, But most of the time, most of the week, I'm, I'm on my own and just um, working on recipes and menus and things like that. I've extended the range now as well on um, um, gluten-free items and I've developed um, a cookie recipe on my own as well. So we do eight different flavors of cookies. Um, so it's it's more a passion project, I guess, um, but it you know, we don't make much money out of it, but um, it's keeping us extremely busy, um, and it keeps our family together. Tom and I works together. Um, we take the kids to work. Uh, I'm at home every night, um, having dinner with my kids, uh, helping with school work and cooking dinner, and um, so yeah. So we do work hard, extremely hard, um, but we have um, we have a a good lifestyle, a good family lifestyle. We just walk in distance from the lake. So every second day, every three days, we, we're down at the lake swimming. Um, we've got a big bush right behind the house. Um, the kids got a uh, dirt bike. So, you know, we, we have a bit of fun as well. So, yeah. What are your reflections on, on everything that you've, you've achieved and that you've been through? Um, I, don't, I don't regret anything I've done. But the best thing happened in my life was probably meeting my wife. Um, she's she's an amazing person. She works really hard. She's well organized. Like between the two of us, we've nearly have 
50 years of hospitality career. Um, so she's been working in hospitality for a really long time as well. Um, and she, um, she create, um, relationships and, uh, with customers and customers become friends and, um, uh, she's also, she's sometime at work as well, at the shop as well. She's, uh, she create, um, um, uh, couples. Um, so she, uh, really, she's a matchmaker. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. She's, uh, she's a bit <laughs> of a matchmaker as well. Um, yeah, she loves being around people. Um, and that's what motivates her to, uh, to go to work every day. Um, our little shop is um, is in a shopping center, um, and uh, we just we just basically situated right between Apple and the Lego shop, and um, so we we're, we're in a great position. But she spent pretty much her days off at the Lego shop, working there as well when she can have a day off. But at least I would say once or twice a fortnight, she spent she does a shift at Lego. Um, just for fun. Um, she, she loves it and she loves being around people. And um, but yeah, so she does that. She go pick up the kids from school and things like that. But, um, but yeah, that's probably the best thing happened in my life was meeting Tara um, and having children. And uh, But it wasn't, you know, I don't regret anything I've done in the past. Um, the only regret, and um, the only regret I have is um, not, and that might become to a surprise to you as well, but um, I haven't been, um, I have, I, I realized since I've been here, um, it came to my, um, to my knowledge that I have high expectation to be diagnosed with ADHD. So when I'm um, 42 years old and you get told something like this, a lot of um, points, hard points or hard things happen in my life or good things or whatever, you know, everything has um, makes sense now. A lot of things make sense in my life now. And, you know, like when we were talking when I was 14 years old and and basically what I did for four years was just putting my head down and working 18 hours a day and getting yelled at and things like that. But I didn't know any better. And that's why I thought I just, you know, I didn't know any better. But now knowing um, about the ADHD, um, it just makes sense. I was just just putting my head down and focusing on something I really loved. Um, yeah. So that's so interesting. So what was it that made you or that, that caused the diagnosis to be made? Was this, did something happen or what, what, how did it come about? My sons, uh, have been diagnosed and obviously it's all genetics and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so we, I, I don't, I talk to Tom about it and I don't really want to, I've spoken to a specialist and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't want to be medicated or anything like that. Um, I'm happy to live the way I'm living now. My wife is happy with me. I'm happy with her. You know, happy wife, happy life. Um, and, um, you know, I think taking back a few steps in my career, you know, it was just the creativity and the... Um, the, the texture, like I always, you know, trying to explain to, to the chef who was working for me, you know, we need texture and visual textures and colors and shape, but the food can always come first. And, you know, it's all about the, the, the texture, the, the creaminess, the acidity, and, you know, all those little factors that makes um, a good dish. And, um, and yeah, so it was just um, the hyper-focus style of ADHD um, and um, yeah so now I know like you know there's a lot of variance in ADHD and so we, we've learned a lot and uh, yeah. the second lockdown so we had two major lockdown here in, um, in Lake Macquarie slash Newcastle and the second the second lockdown that's when we looked after ourselves and our family and that's what we focused on and um, yeah, that's all those bits and pieces and 
came to life. And so it was a bit of a surprise, but, um, but yeah. That's so interesting. And I mean, you mentioned the, the hyper-focus. I mean, are there other, and you mentioned, of course, this head down 18 hours a day when you were 14. I mean, what else during your career could, you know, sort of fell into place? Could you now make sense of? Uh, probably the, I could have never remember, still now, it's hard for me to, to remember uh, people's names. Um, it's, uh, I have to read uh, a book twice before I understand the whole story or a man missed um, chapter. Because I, I do read, but my mind is somewhere else. Um, when, the, like, I do a lot of driving uh, with work, so I listen to a lot of postca- podcasts, including yours. Um, but my mind just kind of disappears, like, goes on. Uh, I focus on my driving and what I'm doing while I'm driving, but often, you know, I, had, I need to press on the uh, 15 seconds back to, to really listen because I've messed a bit or realize oh, what's going on there. So um, it's, yeah, I focus on things that are more important to me. Um, yeah, but when I was... <laughs> When I was a kid, I did find it really hard to read. To read, no, to read. I could read, but to understand the story. And um, and yeah, yeah, so interesting. Um, so I mean, I've, I mentioned the Melly Mello and your time with Michelle Bra. I think you know, obviously, not everybody knows what we're talking about. So, would you be so kind as to just talk about that dish and your interpretation of it, and just sort of how life changing it was for you? Yeah. So the. Um, um, the Meli Melo is basically, Meli Melo mean a mix and match, mix and match of uh, vegetables. But on the menu, it was called um, a souvenir of Laguiole. So remembers for me of when I was working there, you know, I've never wanted to take the dish away. So Michel has uh, created for probably 40 years ago, um, a dish called the Gagouille. So basically, um, when we first opened Embrace, um, we started to work with, decided to start working with a lot of um, vegetables, herbs and flowers because I just came from working with Michel, which is, you know, he, talk, he had a, a massive influence on, uh, on my cooking and things. And um, so we created a dish um, called the Meli Melo vegetables. So it was a lot of vegetables, herbs, flowers, um, but it was a lot of different textures. So I think it was basically, I wasn't trying to educate people, but there was um, trying to make people um, rediscover um, textures of vegetables and flavors of vegetables. So it was a dish, basically, you eat one veg- one piece of vegetables at a time. But we also had, because I never liked wastage, so we used the, the peel and the, the bits and pieces we had in making different purees or making different um, emulsions and things like that. And so you could use your vegetable and dip it in one of the emulsion and eat your vegetables. So basically, you could sit with somebody across your table, have the exactly same dish, but different texture, different uh, flavors. Um, um, and the dish was always different every day. Sometime from lunch to dinner, the vegetable dish was different because we had different vegetables to we were receiving in the, in the kitchen. So we had different vegetables we had to use. Uh, we were using different farmers, um, um, and um, and yeah, so it's it was a, a dish of discovery or rediscovery, I guess. Um, but that was really kind of a signature dish that Embrace was really known for. And I think Embrace was really known for that kind of discovery, creativity. Um, uh, we 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 made, but it was all working together as a team as well. It wasn't just me; it was all the all the all the members, all the all members of the team, um, and yeah. So it was um, it was an interesting dish, uh, and most of the flower herbs, I would say, most of them, all of them, uh, was um, grown by us or 
uh, I was going to pick them. Like we were living just near one diet, so there's a lot of empty at the time. There was a lot of empty land and fields and stuff like that. We, I could go and pick things. Um, and um, and yeah, so and farmers as well. We were asking some farmers to, to grow things specially for us or to overgrow, like, you know, overgrowing corianders or parsley. Um, uh, turnips just 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 for the flowers uh, or for the seeds and using them into the into the dish or the other dishes as well yeah I think it was a really important I suppose uh, conversation that you had with Melbourne through through that dish and, and so many others I also I mean the your forest floor chocolate parfait was another signature a lot of your desserts were really um yeah the, you know really spoken of and really made people think it's um yeah i think really important dishes and restaurant for melbourne um so yeah thanks for doing that <laughs> sorry i came on a hot night and um freaked you out but <laughs> there's uh, there's actually a dish um i created once and um uh we had when we just opened uh a brooks um it was just a few days in and ala wolf tasker came um for for lunch and she brought me this amazing um bunch of roses uh from her garden and the first thing she said to me she said they are from my they are from my garden maybe you can use them and she also brought me um, a sample from uh, from a supplier just near Dale's Ford, who she brought for me, um, of um, cream cheese. And I said, before she, le- I said to myself and the rest of the team, before she leaves the restaurant, we need to make something for her. And on the spot, we created, uh, because we were actually working on a berry and licorice dish at the time. And basically, before she left the restaurant, that's when we created the rose cheesecake with licorice and berry um, ice cream. And she had that for her, the last course of a meal. And that dessert stayed on the menu for quite a few years as well. Ah. Uh, and just, um, yeah. Amazing. Is that like the the um cream cheese that we you gave me the recipe for the thermo mix yes so the cream cheese so we we baked uh, we baked a cheesecake and it's then bleeds into the into the thermo mix so you get all the caramelization um um goes into it and you end up with something really smooth really rich a kind of a sweet uh, uh, umami um, with a few berries and um, the licorice ice cream on the top, and that's wrapped completely in rose petals, and uh, and yeah, so the the hint of the the petals and the, the acidity of the petals because rose doesn't taste like it smells. Um, so yeah, so it's um, it was um, a great dessert. That's so beautiful, Nick. And so yeah, Ala Wolf Tasker, obviously the founder of Lake House and such an enormous um, figure in Victorian dining what was her response to this like this creation in her honor yes she, she was pretty amazed i think <laughs> but uh, but no it was um yeah it was it was just it was for her and um yeah it was it was a desert i created for her on that day um but yeah i love it so nick i mean you know, you you've got such a great perspective on on the industry, and you've had such an interesting pathway. Obviously, you know, lots more to come as well. But I just wonder, you know, so many people working in hospitality have had cause to ponder, you know, what they're doing and what might be next for them through this incredibly tricky couple of years. I mean, what what do you think are some good questions that people could ask themselves, uh, or perhaps lessons to take from this period? Um. <laughs> It's a really, I think it's a really personal, like we, Ty and I have talked a lot about this and, um, you know, it's a really personal kind of subject. It's really hard, especially with all the vaccination and don't get vaccinated. And, you know, Ty and I are about to, to get our third shot next week. Um, and I just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, every business is suffering you know it's um it's no an easy place to be um and i think a lot of people really reevaluated their their life 
the lifestyle, we certainly did did. Uh, we had all those plans when we when we started True Party Three, and um, we we were really close to to expand and to to grow. Or um, we and obviously we we got hit with with COVID, and that was just um, so we 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 created um, True Party Three doing market and events, but we opened our first shop. Um, just two months before COVID, the first COVID. So we never, in a way, we were lucky to have the shop because that kept us, even if it was 20, 20 bucks in the bank or $200 in the bank, that kept us going because all the markets we had booked and planned, all the events we had, was everything was just cancelled. So the shop did keep us going for a little bit. Um, so in a way, we were lucky to have that. But since we opened the shop, we've never, never had a normal normal. We don't know what normal is. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been, you know, um, it's been hard. But it's, yeah, and everybody's saying it's hard. And, you know, I think it's it's hard. And I do understand it's hard. But it might be time for people to 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 live with it I don't, I don't know how people will take it will take what I'm saying you know and I don't really really don't want to offend anyone but you know we we have we have a really small business it's my wife and I um, in a business and we have two young children and you know our, our business needs customers and we we could produce you know some weekend we product we made up to close to 3000 uh pieces of eclairs and just and selling them over 3 days and at the moment we we're doing 90 because i can produce more i can make more you know i've got the energy i've got the equipment i've got i've got everything for it but there's just no customers around um, and it's just when, when, when enough is enough, when have people going to come back out and enjoy? And, and like I said, I don't want to upset anyone, but we need to live with this, you know, when we need to live with this new normal, even I'm saying that, but I don't know what new normal is because we open a shop two months before COVID so I've got no idea what a new normal is um, and it's but we need customer businesses any businesses you know the entertainment uh, industry is struggling uh, we have amazing talent in Australia and um, and they're gonna they're gonna get too old they're not gonna get that special moment where somebody's going to find them you know it's it's really tight and entertainment industry it's a really tight industry and um you know it, when the door is closed for them the door is closed that's it it's too late and you know some of those young people have big dreams but um we need to get back at we need to be careful we need to be safe but we need to go back out and and entertain ourselves and and you know um and and get the economy going and and be safe like it's 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 a tricky balancing act isn't it, it? exactly it's just finding the right balance um and i do understand you know we we have people with disabilities and people who want to be vaccinated but they can't but people who can get vaccinated, they don't want to. So where is the right balance here? You know, what? it's it's hard. It's it's hard. But there's business that need to be around, and we need them. And you know, um, it's um, we need to support them the way we can. There's family out there. You know, it's um, um, it's. 
we need to try to really take that step forward and just say enough is enough. We really need to get back out. Yeah, look, I really, I really <clears throat> feel your anguish and and yeah, really re- respect the conundrum that you're putting forward. It is it is just so tough, and I think the what I'm hearing from a lot of business owners is that, you know, this has been the hardest period, you know, this last month or so. And it, there are a lot of very small businesses like yours that are really just clinging on. And uh, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I think, as you say, you know, these are, these are families, these are people and um, whether it's through more government support or, um, you know, a business boost, it's like, um, it, it definitely is a tragedy for uh for these small businesses to, yeah, not have the wherewithal to continue, which unfortunately is is what is what's happening with, for some people in their in their in their businesses. So it's 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 the biggest question we've got, isn't it, Nick? It's so huge. Yes, exactly. But it's just like you said, you know, it's just really finding the the right balance and and um, and yeah, you know, it's um, we have. Yeah, it's um Yeah, well, let's finish on an up note and tell me about the if I came to see you um at the shop, what eclair would you insist that I try? Well, we'll make it easy for you. We always have seven flavors and we can do seven a box of seven eclairs. So, it would be one of it, I guess. <laughs> Great. <laughs> What's something that you're loving making? Yeah. What we really try to do is really um um, making a pleasant treat, so it's um, it's pleasant. It's not overly sweet. It's um, it's light. All the eclairs have different flavored uh, custards. Uh, the topping is a mousse or cheesecakes, um, and we use rayon ingredients. Um, um, we we are really proud of the product we're making uh, and we're selling, um, and we try to suit. Like we try to create a right balance, so we always have something a little bit sour, a little really acidic, and um, something a little bit more adventurous. And we had um, a flavor that always stays on the menu, which is really fashionable, which is a salted caramel with candied peanuts and gold. So the gold doesn't taste like anything. Um, it's just for for show, I guess. But it's really beautiful to look at. Um, it's filled with. Um, um, uh, a salted caramel, so we use a Murray River salt um, uh, caramel custard on the inside, um, and the topping is a cheesecake. But instead of using cream cheese, I use mascarpone. Um, so it just gives it a, a beautiful, um, light uh, textures. Um, a few uh, peanuts that have been cooked in um, in a sugar syrup, which is half sugar, half water, and then dried in the oven overnight. So you get a lovely crispiness, but an intense flavor of uh, peanuts and a little gold uh, chocolate disc. Um, we actually have a new menu coming up uh, in the next couple of days. And... Um, we will have um, a strawberry with um, a basil on the menu. So strawberry basil or as being one of my favorite. We used to I used to make lots of desserts with strawberry and basil. Um, so that's going to be um, a custard which has been flavored with um, uh, fresh basil. So that will be on the inside of the eclair, and the topping is um, a strawberry. Uh, mousse with half uh, cream but half um, smooth ricotta cheese just to give a little more body to it and uh, the the strawberry have been infused for a couple of days with fresh basil leaves and um, and raw pureed so you keep that beautiful freshness from the from the strawberry um, and I had a handful of um, white strawberry like unripe strawberry in there as well just to bring a touch of acidity in there. Um, so we get all those great balance through through the menu. Um, so, yeah, so it's great. But that, that point of balance in the, in the menu, that's what keeps me going. That's the, um, um, that's the point of creativity, the, the, the science of it, I guess. That's what, that's what I, like. I like doing. But it's not something we show. It's people eat eclairs, they eat our eclairs um, with mousse, cheesecake, custard on the inside. But we really try to cut down the sugars. Like it's 
because when we started this, I was looking at different recipes and, and to me, to my children, to my wife, there was way too much sugars in those recipes. So basically, I used my chef background into the patisserie uh, concept. So I do uh, completely, um, I do my custard with no sugar in it. And I do a big batch of natural um, custard and... Um, then when the custard is made, it's unsweetened, and I sweeten and flavor it with um, fruit purees. So real fruits, um, purees, and um, and again, it's all about the, the testing because a strawberry one day and a strawberry the next not going to taste the same. So yeah, so it's just creating those lovely flavors and textures and stuff into, um, it's basically treating an eclair like a, like a cake. Mm. It sounds, they sound amazing. And I just love the detailed thought behind everything and every element that you produce, Nick. And I'm definitely going to need that box of seven, or I'm kind of thinking maybe I might need two boxes of seven because um, I think I'm going to need more than one of each. But um, thank you so much for sharing your story with me today. It's just it's really, yeah, I, I've just loved listening to you speak and learning more about what you do and also, yeah, remembering some beautiful dishes of yours that I've ate over the years. So thank you so much for joining us today on Dirty Linen, Nick. It's been a privilege. Thank you, Danny. It was really a great pleasure. But I just want to add one last thing, kids. Um, I just really want to thank you for everything you've done. Like has been obviously from New South Wales, I'm really following what you've been doing for the industry and it's it's really remarkable. And so it's a, it's a big thank you. You've done a lot of digging, a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Um, I saw you crying a few times and stuff. Like you really put a lot of emotions into this. And um, so, you know, to me, if there was a um, Australian of the Year, I would give you the award. So thank you, Danny. Um, you're doing great. I love the, I love the postcards, podcast because it's, it's really honest. Um, it's, it's, it's a really true podcast and it's how the hospitality industry feels and is and should be. And uh, so congratulations. It's, uh, it's you doing a fabulous job. Well, thank you so much for the kind words and thank you for bringing your honesty and, yeah, your real spirit of hospitality to this podcast. You're part of it. So really appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. Take care. Thank you. Bye. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. Peace.